radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening. Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio 4. Masses. Uh, yeah, I just love doing that. I really do. Joe's Garage. In case you didn't know, today's Wednesday, September 19th, 2018. 266 days into the new year, just 99 days left. We are live from a bunker somewhere in the middle of beautiful downtown Burbank, California. And I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and tither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR. The Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planets. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. That's right. Because we've had an amazing week on the show. And tonight it continues because we have very special guest Clifford Stone is here. That's right. Clifford Stone on Disclosure. That's what we're going to do tonight. And he's very excited about our conversation now uh, that is about to happen tonight. And I'm I'm going to chalk this up right now in advance as uh, one of our most important shows. That's what I am going to do. I'm going to roll the dice on this right now. All of the documents, everyone that we are going to discuss tonight on the show are over at jimmychurchradio.com. And through our flurry, there's a lot of documents, a lot of stuff to do. Um, And they should all be uh, good to go. I didn't check right before showtime. Uh, Drew was still uh, finishing things up, but uh, they should all be there. Okay, so all of the documents. Now, if you're listening to the show later, in uh, our podcast application or or uh, what else do we do here? I guess we do YouTube. So if it's if it's up there and you're listening to you've got to go over to JimmyChurchRadio.com and uh, uh, click on Clifford's name or search Clifford Stone later and and go and get those documents. Okay, so that's uh, that's what you've got to do. okay? I wonder how many people, You know, because this is a live show, Um, uh, there are so many out there that use our podcast or download through the membership area later because they can't be here live. Um, And that's a pretty good size group. I wonder I wonder how many actually, you know, listen on YouTube and hmm, yeah, uh, because we're going to shut YouTube down. (laughs) So I don't even know. It's such a small part of uh, what we do. But I know that. There are those on YouTube that only go to YouTube, and they're, they're going to be like, no, don't stop. But 
Uh, on Stellar is where it's at, man. It's not about YouTube. I've got some updates on YouTube uh, here uh, coming up, uh, so just uh, stay posted for that. It's going to blow your mind. Um, OnStellar.com is the place to be. Go there, OnStellar, O-N-S-T-E-L-L-A-R.com. Register. It is the new, dynamic, beautiful social media network that is built for this community. Everything that you do on any other network or platform you can do over at OnStellar, onstellar OnStellar.com. Of course, Twitter, follow me there, at J Church Radio. Facebook still chugging along, and so is YouTube. So, is YouTube. so you can go uh, over to Jimmy Church Radio and, and follow, like, and subscribe, do whatever you want. At J Church Radio, though, is Twitter. Hashtag F2B is the sandbox. Hashtag F2BQ is fade to black questions. You can also email throughout the show, jimmychurchradio.com. Welcome, everybody. It's going to be a great show. All right. Breaking news. Let's just get straight to it because I'm going to open the show with breaking news on Krispy Kreme donuts. Mm-hmm. Yep. Krispy Kreme. Once again, once again, Krispy Kreme is not participating in the talk like a pirate day. Yeah. In previous years. The coffee and donut chain celebrated the September 19th holiday today by giving away free donuts to customers who walked in dressed like a pirate, free donuts. Talk like your favorite pirate, free donuts. Not anymore. Two years in a row. What a drag. And it looks like, you know, I'm going to have to continue with my fast start diet that I am on. Yeah. Lost a lot of weight. Can you tell? How do I look? Do I look good? Do I look good? I feel trim. I feel trim. I mean, I, I kind of look the same, right? Right? I guess. Eh, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. But I feel... No, I've lost. I've lost a lot of weight. And I am uh, on the uh, Fast Start Diet. And you can go and find Fast Art Diet over on Amazon. You can go to their website, fastartdiet.com. The links for them are over at jimmychurchradio.com. Three-day diet. It's a fasting diet. But, you know, everybody knows about fasting. So this is a fast start diet that combines things and starts to prepare you for a fasting uh, future for yourself. And you can figure things out. But those three days are a game changer. They really are. They really are. The first day's rough. First day's rough, but you just got to get through that. Second day, you wake up and you're like, okay, it's it's not going to be that bad. And then by the end of the third day and you start to see the changes, you're like, wow, this stuff really, really worked. It's a well-done diet. So there you go. Fast start diet. It's a three-day diet. Everything that you need comes in a box. Three days, three packages, day one, day two, day three. It's all there. And you get their Lipo 3 Appetite Suppressant Spray, too, as well. As a bonus, because you're a fade or not. Okay? And the promo code is TALK. TALK. Okay. All right. My grandma isn't playing Farmville on OnStellar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's funny. That's the other thing about OnStellar. No advertising, no games, nothing like that, man. It's so old school. It's beautiful. OnStellar.com. Yesterday, Monsanto asked a California judge to throw out a $289 million jury verdict awarded to Dwayne Johnson, not The Rock, but another Dwayne Johnson, who said the company's glyphosate-based weed killers, including Roundup, gave him cancer. And a jury decided that Monsanto was guilty. The company said in motions filed in San Francisco Superior Court of California that the jury's decision was not supported by the evidence presented at trial. Johnson's case filed in 2016 was fast-tracked to trial due to the severity of his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, a cancer of the lymph system. That was caused by years of exposure to Roundup and Ranger Pro, another Monsanto herbicide that contains glyphosate. Monsanto, how dare you? 
Uh, I'm not going to let this one go. All right, here we go. This is, this is some other big news. Google has announced that it will discontinue YouTube gaming. That's right. I didn't stutter. And they will merge most of its dedicated features with the main YouTube site and app. YouTube is where more than, now check, I need you to listen to what I am about to say. YouTube is where more than 200 million gamers go every single day. 200 million. (laughs) Think about that. 200 million. Population of the United States (laughs) goes to YouTube every day calling themselves gamers. That's right. That's insane. I Before you say it, that's not the population. You understand what I'm trying to say? Over half of the United States population, think about that. They watched over 50 billion hours of gaming content in the last 12 months alone. 50 billion hours. Oh, my God. That's why in March 2019, Google will retire the YouTube gaming app and push everything over to YouTube and make some more money. Insane. That's insane. (laughs) Think about that. Subscribe to our podcast. It's only $2 per month. Just go to jimmychurchradio.com, click on the podcast banner. It's right there, $2 a month. We have, uh, I don't even know, how many how many shows do we have? Nine Over 900 shows right there for just $2 a month. You can also become a fade or not in our membership. What's wrong with my tongue? Our membership section on the site. Just click on the banners. Now, don't forget to visit all of our sponsors here at jimmychurchradio.com. I just mentioned Fast Start Diet. And, of course, we have uh, Life Change Tea, uh, Ancient Life Oil, River Moon Coffee. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Numana Food Storage, emergency food storage for you and your family. Go and visit all of them. Sacred Skulls, the nicest jewelry that you've ever seen. And I'm not kidding about that. Sacred Skulls. Visit everybody by clicking on the banners over at jimmychurchradio.com. Let's get the show cracking. Happy birthday to today, Twiggy. Twiggy is 69 years old. Now, for those of you that don't know who Twiggy is, and it's a possibility, you know, I understand that it's a generational thing. Twiggy slayed in the Blues Brothers. All right, a lot of people remember her from that. But it's not, when I think of Twiggy, I don't think of the Blues Brothers anymore. I think of Club Paradise, one of my favorite, funniest movies of all time, and Twiggy was amazing in that. Happy birthday, Twiggy. Today, she is 69. Our dead guy's birthday today, short and sweet, Adam West, 1928 to 2017, made it all the way to the double eight, 88 years old. The OG Batman, original gangsta. That's it. That's all I got when it comes to Adam West. Right there. The OG Batman. And that's still the best series. And just like Star Trek, you know, Batman and all of the other stuff. I, I, I understand that, man. But that's that's not what endeared us to Batman, you know, today. No, it's the original series. The original series. Robin and... Catwoman and the Joker, right? The Penguin. That's that's what, man. That's Batman, and it's the same thing with Star Trek. And I know, I get it. Uh, Star Trek continues, and uh, boy, and all that. Okay, it's all cool. It's all cool. The original Star Trek, the original series. That's that's the Star Trek for me. Okay, all right. On this day in history, OTD, nineteen fifty seven. The United States detonates a 1.7 kiloton nuclear weapon 900 feet underground in a tunnel at the Nevada test site, 
65 miles north of Las Vegas. One hour drive. One hour outside of Las Vegas. Shock waves were felt all the way to Alaska on this day in 1957. Fader fact. Stubbs was the mayor of Talkeetna, Alaska. From July 1997 until his death in July of 2017. Stubbs was a cat. And that is your fader fact. Got his own uh, Wikipedia page, too. Stubbs the cat. He was called Stubbs because the, the, uh, uh, they had a, a, a box full of kittens that the store owner gave away. One kitten was left. Stubbs. And they named him Stubbs because his tail was short. Yeah. So they called him Stubbs. And he became mayor. So there you go. That's a fader fact. <laughs> it's been vetted too. Tonight, Clifford Stone is here. We're going to talk disclosure. And now... All of the documents that we are going to discuss tonight are over at jimmychurchradio.com. You may download them. You may keep them. You may share them with the world. Clifford has been uh, uh, discovering, finding, searching through the Freedom of Information Act and his other sources for documents uh, for decades and decades. This is uh, part of his uh, collection of documents and these reach back a long ways, and we're going to talk about disclosure today, and did it almost happen before? Okay, we're going to talk about this, and these are the documents that are going to support everything that we are going to discuss tonight on the show. It's going to be an amazing, amazing conversation. Tomorrow's another Fader Night, open lines all night long. John Rappaport's going to be here with his No More Fake Newsroom Live followed by open lines. Okay, so there you go. It's been an amazing week. Now, listen to me. Today, QAnon answered this question. Question posted was, questions, was, did NASA fake the moon landings? Have we been to the moon since then? Are there secret space programs? Is this why the Space Force was created? And QAnon answered with this, and I quote, False. Moon landings are real. Programs exist that are outside of public domain. End quote. Signed, Q. Now, uh, oh, as I said that, Tanette just uh, posted up uh, some other stuff. This is on September 19th from Q. I didn't get to this one, Tanette, but thank you. Uh, Q, are we alone? Roswell. Answer, no. Highest classification. Consider the vastness of space. Q. Yep. And now, there has been, you know, am I Q? No, I am not Q. Okay, so let's, let's just clear that up right now. Certainly these are uh, answers that I could possibly give. But isn't it interesting? Now, through all of the Q stuff, I have not, uh, I've only uh, checked Q out when I've been sent Q material. No, no, that's not even, that's not even true. Uh, but the only Q material, uh, let me say this correctly, the only Q material that I have checked out is the material that has been sent to me. Today, Nuna Bencourt is 51 years old? Really? I took all his money one night in poker in Memphis. That's a that's a whole other story. Now, um, I've only checked out Q stuff that has been sent to me, not all of it. And uh, I I understand how and where it gets posted, but that would take up 
that would take up the rest of my life, let alone the rest of my day, uh, spending time over there doing it. So I depend on others to send this stuff to me when it's relevant. Now, as far as I know, and you guys can, there's everybody knows more about Q than I do. Okay, so I'm no Q expert. But as far as I know, is this the first time that Q has alluded to a secret space program? Is this the first time that this has happened? Is this the first time Q has talked E.T. and aliens and Roswell? You know, and I don't know who is posting the questions to Q. Um, this are, are We Alone is from Anonymous, right? That's from Anonymous, so I don't know. I don't know who's, I'm not, I'm not sending the questions in. And this other one is from Anonymous, too. Okay, so these were sent to me uh, earlier, and uh, thank you for posting them. Has Q done any more, has there any, uh, has there been any other postings uh, since these about E.T. Or, or Roswell or the Secret Space Program. I don't know. So if they have, post them up there on Twitter and I'll catch them. But anyway, this is what I find interesting. Q, I don't have any inside information, but I have, I have some pretty depth dependable sources, and one in particular that I've talked to about Q that I wasn't surprised that this person knew about Q, but this person is so outside of our UFO community and, and so forth. But um, Q out there in the mainstream um, has only caught on in the last few weeks, right, where you're getting these mentions of Q in, in the mainstream media and stuff. It's always been part of our conspiracy com uh, community. But I was told uh, that, and I could be way wrong here, so don't, you know, just just save it. If you've got a theory on who Q is, stick with it, okay? If you think you know, you have definitive proof as to who Q is or, may, or, or, or group or whatever, then stay with it because you don't know any more than I do. <laughs> That's what it comes to that is that Q was a singular person inside of the White House. That's right, inside of the White House, part of the administration. And then that Q is no longer posting his Q, and that now Q um, still may have elements inside of the White House, but it's a group. It's now a group. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a collective now, see, and again, I don't know. I'm not some Q expert. I'm just, I can use the word allegedly or whatever, might be. And, uh, but getting into this conversation, going from the other subjects that have been covered and, and jumping into this is pretty interesting. So these answers are our community based. Does that make sense? These are answers that come from those in the know inside of our community. Yeah. To say that programs exist that are outside of the public domain and the, the moon landings are real, that's, that's a pretty interesting comment. That comes from somebody that is well-researched inside of our community. This comment about Roswell. You know, Roswell is something that is inside of our community outside of our community yeah you know you're you're gonna it was mentioned in independence day and it's kind of gotten out there and but but most people in the public don't know about roswell most don't it may be the most famous case inside of our community that everybody knows everything about but getting out to another 7.49 billion people on this planet don't know about roswell you need to think about that for a second so what is Q doing with the Roswell knowledge? What is Q doing with uh, the secret space program knowledge, the, the Apollo fake moon landings? This is this shifts it for me a little bit. It does. I mean, are there people, This and this is where you need to go with me. Are there people inside of the White House that, that know about the fake 
moon landings or it being a hoax and Kubrick to the secret space program, right, to Roswell and are we alone in the universe, Consider the vastness of space. Now we've got a very unique individual. If they are inside of the White House walking around with those thoughts, I'm leaning away from that. I'm leaning away and wondering if Q is somebody that is from inside of our community. Yeah. Yep, yep. And so uh, I've got a lot of uh, QAnon followers. I get a lot of uh, QAnon email. Um, And just like anybody else, if you want to reach out to me and and clarify things, fine. You want to keep the mystery out there, fine. Whatever. It doesn't matter. But I read this, and I'm just like, wait a minute here. You know, we got to pump the brakes. We got to pump the brakes and, like, consider what's going on. Now, for those inside of our community, you read this, you go, oh, okay, yeah, Q, okay, all right, Q gets it. Wait, wait a minute. Do you understand how I am taking a look at this? Okay, this is stuff that, that we hold near and dear inside of our community. And if people are out there walking around outside of our community with this kind of knowledge and they can just talk about it like this and they're supposed to be a government insider trying to change the world, ah. Uh, I got to back up a little bit. All right. Okay. So that's, that's my take on this today. It's very interesting. And now, uh, one other, uh, one other point Q and on is being read by a lot of people outside of our community now. Okay. It was just this little conspiracy thing that was bouncing around on on Reddit and, and forums, but, um, it's, it's not the case anymore. Okay, so a lot of people are reading this. And I thought that we were in the safe zone when it came to QAnon because this stuff wasn't discussed. Ah, kind of bums me out. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Clifford Stone is here. We are discussing disclosure. All of his documents uh, that we will be discussing tonight are posted up over at jimmychurchradio.com. Tonight, it's on the homepage. After tonight or after this week, Search Clifford Stone if you're listening to this later, and then the uh, links will be up there. Tomorrow night is Fader Night. Uh, John Rappaport's going to be here. Open lines all night long. Friday night, I'm off. Saturday night, I'm over at Coast to Coast AM, and my guest is Jason Louvre. There you go. This is Fade to Black. I'm going to get out of here and get right back with our guest tonight, Mr. Clifford Stone. You can follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. Simple. Email is Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. The sandbox is hashtag F2B. And uh, Faded Black Questions right there. Hashtag F2BQ. Who do you think is Q? Who do you think? It's fake. They are not in the White House. It's a huge troll and a very dangerous plot against patriots. Wow. Barra thinks Q may be JFK Jr. Who's Barra? I don't know. Oh, Mike Barra. Whatever happened to that dude? I'll be right back. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you know who. And you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. 
The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go back, Lee Teppy. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. Times are changing. The circus of politics, healthcare's low standards and high prices, and let's not forget food quality. What to do? Arm yourself with Life Change Tea at GetTheTea.com. In a world of chemical imbalance and poor air and water quality, it's time you make a move. Log on to GetTheTea.com and stock up on organic non-GMO supplements. Don't forget the tea. Cleansing your body never felt so good. And we have a brand new tea called Takedown Tea, which helps support healthy glucose. All natural body support so you can be at your best naturally. All you have to do is log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. We're not a fad that comes and goes. We are the real deal. Join us and armor up. GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Changing America's health one tea bag at a time. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Do you want to lose weight but have no idea where to begin? The Fast Start Diet, a three-day weight loss plan, is the answer. Three days of nutritionally balanced, calorie-restricted meals delivered right to your door. No shopping, no measuring, and no cooking. Everything is prepared for you and ready to eat at home or on the go. The Fast Start Diet has all the amazing benefits of intermittent fasting without starving. We've helped thousands of people who have struggled to reach their weight loss goals. Isn't it time we helped you? With the Fast Start Diet, you'll lose weight and feel great. Find Fast Start Diet on Amazon or go to faststartdiet.com and use promo code TALK to get 10% off your first box. And as a special bonus, Fast Start will include their number one rated LiPo3 appetite suppressant spray free with your order. This is Jimmy Church. And whatever your diet plans are, do what I did. Go to faststartdiet.com. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to jimmychurchradio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This Mass is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. You can follow me on Twitter at JChurch Radio. Very important show tonight. Hashtag F2B is the sandbox. There will be a few thousand tweets going up there tonight. And uh, welcome to everybody that is that is out there. All of the documents that we are going to discuss are over at jimmychurchradio.com. They're posted right there. And you may download them. You may keep them. You may share them with the world. And that's direct orders from Sergeant Stone. Also, if uh, you can uh, uh, help me and the producers out, there's a lot of uh, documents there. You can go ahead and post them up on Twitter, too, as well, as we uh, uh, go through everything tonight. Clifford Stone is here. Tomorrow night is Open Lines. Fader Night and John Rappaport will be here with us. No More Fake Newsroom Live. And Friday night, I am off. Saturday night, I'm over at uh, Coast to Coast AM. And my guest will be Jason Louvre. Tonight, it is Clifford Stone, and we are going to discuss his entire life of research and involvement with uh, UFOs and recovery and, and disclosure. And he has one of the largest collections of Freedom of Information Act documents. A portion of those tonight are posted over at uh, JimmyChurchRadio.com. Uh, 
And today our community is talking about disclosure more than ever before, but how close are we to actual government revealing the truth, right, about UFOs and ET? How close were we to this happening in the past? This isn't the first time that we have gone through this. Tonight, Clifford will bring forward his information and documents that reveal how the United States government and our military was ready and willing to announce to the public that E.T. was here and contact had already been made. He is a decorated Vietnam combat veteran. He served 22 years. He claims that he led a double life from the late 1960s through his retirement in 1990 while officially assigned to an NBC team, Nuclear, Biological, and Chemical Retrieval and Abatement Detail. He says that he served on top-secret UFO crash retrieval missions where he had physical contact with downed ET craft and interactions with captured non-human life forms. The official NBC team assignment allegedly served as a cover for those highly secretive and compartmentalized operations over a period of nearly 40 years. He has amassed one of the largest private collections of authentic government documents clearly uh, establishing the hard reality of the UFO phenomenon. And I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, the one and only Clifford Stone. Clifford, good evening, man. How are you? Well, I'm hanging in there, sir, and thank you. Oh, and you know, uh, much respect. And every time that I'm around you or we're on the air, you know, you address me as sir, and and I and that's great, Clifford. It's just me, Jimmy. Okay, so and and uh, and, uh, and, and uh, but your your uh, outlook on life and your discipline is is just amazing to me. And I want to say one thing. I'm I don't even know if you remember this, but. Probably three or four years ago, I was out speaking uh, at the Roswell Festival in Roswell, and you were speaking there too. And I I snuck up and and sat in the back and uh, uh, listened to you uh, speak, and it was one of the most compelling uh, uh, events that I had been to. And I couldn't control myself. And I jumped up in front of everybody there and walked up to you and said, Clifford, let's do Coast to Coast this Saturday. And you said, absolutely. And I walked out the door, and you were on coast with me that week. And uh, that's just how you are. Do you even remember that happening? Oh, yes, sir. I remember. Yeah, it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. And I I was thinking to myself, I couldn't control, you know, there's certain times, and, you know, I just, Clifford, you were just so dynamic, and, and I was like, man, he's got to be heard. You know, he has got to be heard, and that's why you are here tonight. So uh, before we get started, uh, Clifford, um, how are you doing? How's your health? Um, how is life? Mm, my wife, she's getting worse. She's sick. Uh, she had a, a severe stroke. And of course, I had a double, I had a double bypass, and right now they're checking for some other medical complications. So, for the last three weeks, daily, I've uh, I've been going to see a doctor, either at the VA hospital in Albuquerque or Artesia or the doctor here, and my wife is going a lot of times too uh, for her medical situation. So. I always say my time is limited, but I, I need to get this information, particularly what we're going to be talking about tonight. I'm, people need to know exactly what happened and how close it came to the truth coming out. Well, Clifford, um, first off, uh, you need to uh, take care of yourself and your wife and your family. Uh, you, you know, you're too important to this community, and and we need you. So our thoughts and our prayers are, are right there with you. And uh, we'll send out uh, the big uh, the big wave of love your way, and hopefully you'll feel that tonight. But we need you, man. You know, so so just just take care of yourself, okay? So thank uh, you, sir. Uh, I appreciate that. And uh, there you go. All right, now let's uh, let's talk a little bit about today before we move backwards. Um, the last uh, ten months or so since. December 16th, 2017, we've had a wave of UFO uh, disclosure and conversations in the mainstream media. 
that started with the New York Times and the Washington Post and went around uh, to all of the mainstream television and, and print uh, and Internet media everywhere was talking about uh, UFOs. It, now, probably the most exposure that has ever been. And going back to the early 1950s, uh, uh, through that UFO wave, that that was a pretty big period. But today, was it was pretty dynamic, and nobody alive uh, uh, today has ever seen uh, anybody that wasn't around back then. Clifford has no idea this was the most coverage that they've ever seen. Um, how did that make you feel? Uh, finally, having modern mainstream media discussing the UFO topic and contact like they did over the last 10 months? Well, it made me feel good, but the exception of one thing. Why didn't me- mainstream media pursue it more? They they dropped it. I mean, they they totally just let it go by the wayside, even though they had key uh, documents, key people that was talking. Uh, the CIA, the DIA, the... Uh, uh, DITC, all of these people, they tried to downplay their doc, but they had documents. And of course, they didn't use the term UFO. They were using the term advanced unconventional aircraft, which is why the gentleman, I can't, I never can remember his name, when he was talking about uh, him being party to this, where they were gathering information on these uh, advanced uh, unconventional aircraft. He went ahead and stated this is what they were calling them. And one of the reporters on one of the major TV stations asked him point blank, do you believe that some of these objects or these aircraft are of extraterrestrial origin? And he very carefully chose how he answered. He said, in my opinion, I do believe some of these are of extraterrestrial origin. And the whole situation is, they say that they started this in, what, 2002 and ended in uh, 2012. It's been going on for a long time. And, you know, just recently, and I think that's because we heard the terms, uh, the CIA started to release some documentation on it. DIA, which the gentleman in question was really working for at the time of his involvement, started to release some information. Uh, Minimal information has been released by Department of Defense, and uh, one of the congressional offices, they released some information, but it was very limited. Uh, They really didn't want to discuss it, which is why I'm not naming the congressional office. But the whole situation is, is that there was a major effort where all this was coming out. Now, what happened was they had that film footage that was released. All the major networks stated they got that uh, uh, Navy film footage from the Department of Defense. What a lot of people aren't aware of, the Department of Defense denied this. And I honestly uh, believe, and I'll say in my opinion, that Department of Defense is lying about that. And I would have loved to have seen just one of the major networks take exception and immediately state that, whoa, wait a minute, we got it from you people. What do you mean that you never released it? The uh, uh, the communications officer for the Pentagon uh, did come out and she said, well, a couple of, it was almost like she said, contradicted herself. But she clearly said it, that, that the, 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 the project wasn't named this, it was named this. That was the first thing. The second thing that she said was that uh, we have not authorized the release of any videos. Right, and then there was uh, something else that came out a little bit more generic. Um, that uh, if they were to be released, it wouldn't be through this department. So that was kind of a weird thing to say. I mean, 
it, it was so cut and dried before the, in the other statement that this other statement left like a door open for this. And I, I oh, could there, there, there was a cover up. There was, there was a right. mass effort to squelch the story. Back in '46, what we did, we went ahead and accused uh, Sweden and Denmark of lying about their ghost rockets and stating that the uh, only reason they were talking about these or even bringing them up is because they wanted more radar equipment from us. That was a total out-and-out out lie. Behind the scenes, we had personnel. Many of these people were on the Robinson panel, which we'll probably talk about later on. But they were involved trying to find the ghost rockets, doing the telemetry where they thought they should crash. They go there, there's nothing there, which means... This was something that was flying in the air, didn't crash, and continued to go. The reason they were looking for the crashes was that he initially thought that they were uh, V-1, V-2 uh, rockets that was being launched by the former Soviet states in test flying. These went off course and went into Sweden and Denmark. Now, with that being said, one, we knew then that these were, were not illusions, but they were real objects. Initially, we thought they were of uh, Soviet origin, where they were testing V-1, V-2s, just like we were here in the States. But the one key point was, if that was the case, we would have found debris because they would have crashed. We didn't find that. So we were still looking for what these objects were. But when the media here in America started to pick up on what happened in 46 as a result of the June 24th Kenneth Arnold UFO sighting. They immediately went ahead and called foul on Sweden and Denmark. And this later on would actually lead to a problem with the CIA and the FBI. The, uh, the version of disclosure today... Clifford, I want your definition of that. D disclosure can mean anything to anybody, and it, it certainly it's whatever their interest is. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to uh, mean uh, UFOs or ET. But um, disclosure inside of our community is uh, not any type of drip drip or the media or anything else. The only thing that they will accept is the president of the United States stepping up to a podium live on television saying, we've made contact, we've been making contact, E.T. is real, we are not alone in the universe. And until that happens, dis that anything else is just not disclosure, it's what they're already used to. Um, what What is disclosure for you? Disclosure for me is uh, getting the documentation out that clearly shows something's going on and that uh, we get to the point, that apex, where they can no longer deny what the documentation is saying and eventually come out and say, okay, you know, for security reasons, and that's what they're going to say, we have had to keep this under wraps. But now we feel you have a need to know, but we want to make sure that, that it's being handled to the point where you realize there's nothing to fear from this. And at that point, it's going to break. And I can tell you right now that within the UFO realm, within the U.S. government, and other governments included, you have some people that are in control of the UFO information. The really powerful people are still keeping it under wraps. But there's a major effort in the nations that are involved in trying to get this information slowly but surely out to where eventually we can go ahead and draw a picture and say, okay, here's what's been going on and it's still going on today. In the intelligence community, you have what's called uh, counterintelligence analysts. These people have to take 10% of the intelligence data coming in on a potential threat to the U.S. government uh, and I'm using the U.S. government because I know more about it than the other governments. But they take that 10%. With that 10%, they have to go ahead and create the whole picture. They have to go ahead and accurately 
fill in the other 90%. Now, once that happens, then it's sent to their customers in, in the field, and they make the decisions on what to do with it. And, and, you know, we don't even have to go to the UFOs on that. All we have to do is go to TED of 1968. The FBI, in March of this year, released literally several thousand documents showing we all knew what was going to happen in TED of 68. But we felt that, you know, it, it can't be. We rejected it, even though all the documentation was coming in. We totally rejected that the uh, communists would launch any type of offensive over the Tet holidays. We knew that they would lose too many people, and it would be a catastrophic defeat for them militarily. What the powers that be that sat back in a situation room looking at a map and going over papers, who wasn't over there beating the bush in the field, what they ignored was the fact the communists were not looking for a military victory there. They were looking for a political victory. They got that political victory. From that moment on, from that period of time, everything went downhill because the whole situation is the American people were very upset with the U.S. government for not ending the war more quickly. Now the, the powers that be was listening to the American people and the military in Vietnam, it was like they had been forgotten. And being there, that bothers me. Now, me being involved in UFOs, it bothers me to the point where I want to be a part of the solution and getting the truth out and not let some people... Yes? People... Yes? Uh, there's something going on here. Yeah, what but, was um, that? I heard that. I heard that. What was that? I don't know. Yeah, I heard that in the background. Um, okay. Uh, wow. 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 Okay. Well, when you find out what that they're is, they're not going to. They're not going to keep me quiet. Yeah. That. That was. Uh, it, it, I was. I stopped listening to you and was listening to the background, Clifford. <laughs> I got to admit it. And okay. All right. And that was. That was weird. I was trying to make out what uh, the voice said. Um, was it outside of your house? It was outside by the front door. Wow. Okay. Um, well, uh, we're my gonna... security system was activated. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to be headed towards a break here in about five minutes, and when we do, uh, we'll break for a commercial for about four minutes, and, and you can go and check that out. Um, and keep everything live. Don't hang up the phone so I can listen. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I wanted to ask you this because you brought up a, a very important point, and then we'll start to uh, talk about the documents when we come back after the break. Um, the... The video footage, the gun camera, the gimbal footage, and, and what have you that that it has been released wasn't that spectacular. We've seen uh, you know better UFO footage in the past, but what was interesting about that was uh, that it had allegedly come straight from the Pentagon, which is what you had just said. Now that there are people inside that do control this information. If they were going to, in your opinion, Clifford, if they were going to leak stuff out uh, to a company like To The Stars Academy, is that the best that they can do? I mean, certainly they're sitting on better footage than that, and uh, it, it seemed a little lackluster to me. And then after that, they took their foot off the gas. They just let the story go, and it, it died on the vine. Well, we, we have terrific UFO footage. The, the landing out here at Harlemen. Right. I used to have, uh, what, four, eight hundred foot of, uh, of that landing until it was taken back from me because I, somebody called me and I thought they were covering up on what they were trying to talk about. But, you know, our, our intelligence community isn't dumb. They knew. Within a half hour, they were here gathering all that data. So I lost the film. Now I keep a whole lot of stuff away from the house here. Mm hmm. But the, the situation here, that film was real. But the, the reason they chose to use that film, it supported what the man was saying about them uh, doing the research on uh, these 
unconventional uh, aircraft. That and the whole situation is, is that was the point they were trying to get across. The uh, the National Solar Observatory right there near you in New Mexico was closed down uh, last Thursday, September sixth, by the FBI. And you're right there in that area. Um, yeah, they turned me around. I, it's it's right there. You know, you have Holloman there and White yeah. Sands and, of course, Roswell and you. Right? You're all right there. Uh, what do you think was uh, – we've got about two minutes, Clifford. What do you think was going on with that? I, they, they have officially stated that it was tied to some type of child pornography situation. I think – and I have to say, I think uh, that it actually had something to do with a biological contaminant, and I don't think it was mercury they were worried about. With that being said, please keep in mind, there should not be any biological contaminant other than mercury because of the telescopes that they use there. Right. But the telescopes are intact, and they were not damaged. In short, I, I honestly believe, in my opinion that this child pornography uh, situation tying with it, I think that that right there is a cover story, period. The American people are going to buy it, and it's going to be the end of the story. I don't buy it, and I'm going to keep searching to try to find out what really happened there. The uh, f- uh, We're going to get to the bottom of that, too. It's it, I can already see that uh, the National Solar Observatory story is going to be a tough one. They've, uh, they've chosen to take this uh, tact with it, and w- we all know they're covering something up. W- you know, we know this, but we need to now uh, do all of this work and uh, seriously uh, frustrating work of trying to get to the truth. And it's not going to go away. There's too many people that are on this, including yourself. And uh, I was told to go ahead and consider myself on standby. And hopefully I remembered what I learned while I was on the NBC team. And I said, I'm sick. I walk with a crutch now. Mm-hmm. And I can't do it. Oh, yes, you can. Just remember. N- no phone number, no nothing on my caller ID. Very strange. That's strange. Well, let's take a break right here. Let's let's do this now, and I want you to go and check out uh, who is uh, poking around your front door. I heard the voice. I heard it right there in the background. Our guest tonight is Clifford Stone. We're discussing disclosure. It's what we're going to do, and all of the documents that we are going to start to discuss now are posted over at jimmychurchradio.com. So you can click over there, and we're going to go through all the documents. On the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet, this is Fade to Black. I'll be right back. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA The Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Folks, this is very important information. What's to be said about CBD? AncientLifeOil.com. Our CBD is made from hemp and has .003 THC, which means this wonderful product won't get you high. No matter what amount you take, what does CBD do for the body? My hands are tied. But you can Google CBD benefits and be astounded. When you're finished reading, you'll want to log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com and purchase. Life is good when you feel good. People are tired of pain. People are asking for non-GMO organic products to help them with, (laughs) you fill in the blank. Legal in 49 states, and again, our CBD is made from hemp. Ancient Life Oil is about helping people. One by one by one. If you wonder how good the product is, the CEO takes it every day without miss. AncientLifeOil.com. That's AncientLifeOil.com. Have a great day. Hello, I'm Kakili, and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. 
Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. Well, the <laughs> <laughs> We are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. Reclaim your active lifestyle with Angioprim. Angioprim is the original liquid oral chelation supplement. Chelation helps remove toxins, heavy metals, and cholesterol in your veins and arteries that can cause blockages. Scientific research proves the active ingredient in Angioprim has superior oral chelation action that helps promote cardiovascular health. Find out more. Go to angioprim.com. Talk to a trained consultant by calling Angioprim toll-free, 877-882-7221. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official Fade or Not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hey, it's Grace. Can we talk about something serious for a minute? Your age. Getting old has its perks. But remember, being a few years younger... You know, your hair was thicker, you didn't have so many wrinkles, that extra weight wasn't haunting you, and you just felt better. Well, we can't turn back the clocks and go back 10 or 15 years, but you can start feeling and looking 10 or 15 years younger with Nature's Youth RSF. It's a doctor-formulated daily supplement that helps your body maintain its peak performance and fight the aging process. Imagine sleeping better, looking better, and feeling better. See how Nature's Youth RSF has helped thousands of people just like you at naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. Imagine how it will feel when your family and friends are asking you what you did to look so good. Your secret will be Nature's Youth RSF. It's time to start looking better and feeling better. Learn more and order your Nature's Youth RSF at naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only use night vision goggles from Bearing Optics. You can see your very own green chrome balls today by clicking on their banner at jimmychurchradio.com. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. Welcome back, Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Clifford Stone. All the documents that we are going to discuss tonight dealing with disclosure in the past all the way through today, by the way, everything is connected, are posted over at jimmychurchradio.com. And now, Clifford, uh, who is at your front door? Well, it turned out that it went around to my back door. And? And I hate things like this to happen because it makes you feel like, you know, People are going to think you're crazy. But uh, the dog alerted. I'm not letting him go out. Well, I but, heard a uh, voice. I heard a voice. I heard. Somebody. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, what 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 did what did the voice say? What what did he say? It was a man. It was male. Yeah, you know, it was hard to try to make out what he was saying. And when I opened the back door, I don't even want to say. Okay, all right. They they don't like the idea of me talking about what almost happened uh, in the fifties. Well, okay. Let's let's get into that then. Let's find out what what is it that uh, let's go uh, now. We've got a load of documents here. Do you want me to uh, open these up in order that you sent them to me? Uh, it's probably best to do it that way because it, it actually lays down. A pattern of events that was set in place because people in high places, to include the president, was sick and tired of the lying about what was really going on, wanting the truth. And there was an agency, the major agency that had, they actually released that intelligence directive. Then all the, everyone in the intelligence community would be involved in gathering data on UFOs. By mid-1953, we wouldn't be having this conversation. 
because the world would know that we are not alone in the universe and that we have visitors from out there coming here. <clears throat> Let's go to this first document. And uh, for everybody, just go to document number one. I, I need to go. Let me go over to a Jimmy Church Radio dot com. Let me see how we've got these. Uh, um, hold on for a second, Clifford. Let me pause this. Okay. Oh, I just opened it. Hold on for a second. Okay. The uh, the documents are listed here. Oh, I don't see them. Let me see here. Okay. So we jump back a page. Okay. Here they are. Uh, document two. Okay. The first one is dated uh, July 26th, 27th. The object was on July 20th, and I think that is... Uh, that right there is the Blue Book file, 107 pages dealing with the overflights of the night of July 26th, 27th over Washington, D.C. Yeah, and uh, yes, this, okay, so the documents are here in order. This is the top one. It says document two. Um, yeah, I, uh, like I say, I, right now I have over 100 documents dealing with this. Yeah, that, that's fine. No, I'm just letting our audience know. So document two, the top document, and of all the people that this one, uh, we're starting off with the infamous, all right, Captain uh, oh. Ruppelt. And uh, what? Okay, so let's let's go through this. It, it the subject is discussion of Washington D.C. radar sightings of unidentified object on twentieth and twenty sixth and twenty seventh July nineteen fifty two. Uh, take it away, Clifford. Okay, in this document, it's showing where these objects went over Washington D.C. And it's uh, when you go through the whole hundred and seven pages, you realize that it's not just radar sightings, but People, military people, actually saw the UFOs. Fighters were sent up to intercept the UFOs. In one instance, a uh, fighter aircraft was surrounded by the UFOs, and they kept closing in. Finally, they started to go away. The pilot went ahead, locked on the one that was in front of him, tried to chase after it, but it pulled away like he was setting steel. Uh, Rupelt, when he was uh, told that the president wanted to know what was going on, he went ahead and told the caller that the, the uh, sightings were nothing more than temperature inversions or weather anomaly, uh, that there was really nothing to them. Now, he didn't know that wasn't the case. But, you know, that's what he had been told by the people there at Blue Book, which he was over. But there was a lieutenant, a Navy lieutenant, Newton, who was there at the tower, and Al Chop, who was there at the tower, and several experts on radar that was there at the tower, making it clear that there was no malfunction of the radar, that they were not temperature inversions, and that the objects were good, solid returns. And uh, the whole situation is, is that this is not what the Air Force, the powers that be, wanted to know. Now, what other people don't know, on that same day, July 26, the Air Defense Command issued an order to shoot down any UFO that refused to land when directed to do so. The only reason we know about that is because they went ahead and released a news release, which they immediately withdraw, withdrew. It was uh, put out about 12.30 that day. By 5.30 in the afternoon, it was withdrawn. But uh, the whole situation is, I think, that our visitors, since they overflew Washington and the White House on the night a week earlier to the day on the night of July 19th to the 20th, we didn't get the message. So on the night of July 26th, 27th, they showed up in force. Now, this was a wake-up call for the president, members of Congress, members within the Department of Defense, that there was something going on. These objects were real they were under intelligent control. Therefore, they needed more than just some people going around ham-hogging, saying, oh, they're temperature inversions, all oh, the weather anomaly, they're misidentifications of uh, known aircraft or known phenomena. And in this case, this totally was not it. Also, it showed how vulnerable that 
a, a major city, and particularly a city that was in control of this country, was to aircraft of some sort flying, and we were powerless to stop them, even to the point where it was a violation of the restricted air corridors, ADIZ, to fly over the White House. They had several UFOs fly over the White House, stop, and there was nothing we could do about it. So, yeah, the, the President of the United States was very concerned. There's uh, two so points. Well, they started something. Yeah, there's two points. Well, the, this this first document is an amazing read. And there, it, on, on page five of the document, uh, it says right there that Rupelt got a phone call uh, from uh, the newspaper there. It's probably the Washington Post, I would assume, right? But It was Washington Post. Washington Post. And he was, he was told... That he and this is this is a report after the fact, but that he was told he was not to speak to the press, and and, he was. and, and that was on that's that's on page five. And what what transpired from there, everybody can go and read. But if you go forward to page seventy three, these are my notes. This is on page seventy three. And I'm going to read uh, directly from the document. Visual sightings were reported by both ground and airborne witnesses. The descriptions, yes, the descriptions by the witnesses were generally the same. The objects were described as changing from orange to green and back to red. The numbers varied from one to six with no apparent set formation. Three objects were reported to have left trails. The motions of the objects, for the most part, appeared erratic. In some instances, the objects were described as meteors. Very interesting thing to have in this document. Um, uh, For a variety of reasons, but for me... I have seen this exact thing with my own eyes. Yes, sir. Me too. <laughs> right, and, and absolutely, and, and that's on page uh, that's on page seventy three. Um, and now, oh, go to page eighty. Okay. There's a drawing there. No okay. one can explain what that drawing. Why that drawing's there and what it's supposed to be. Oh, I saw this. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, well, there's a couple of things in here that definitely seem out of place. So, yes, everybody go to page 80. And here we have, I, okay, I'll let you describe what we're looking at here. I, I, it's, it's rather apparent to me until I take a second look. Okay, so what well, what, what what are we what seeing look, here? What you're looking at looks like a, a drawing of a little devil, and probably back in the day they'd call that a gremlin. Right. But the, this gremlin, you know, has the three fingers, if you look closely, and if you look at the toes, three toes. Uh, it's got, of course, the tail. Uh, got real sharp teeth. But what I find interesting is the fact that it appears to have some type of suit on. An insignia. And over the right-hand side, I think it is. Yes. It appears to have like an uh, uh, what would what would we would call some type of emblem, but it's like oval shape. But that's about as far as it goes. They have no writing in it. I think, I think that a person put that in there for one reason, so that people would understand that there were people who were working in the UFO field that, by everything they saw. And all their investigations concluded someone else was behind the intelligence and the technology on UFOs, and it did not originate on this planet. And I think out of frustration, that's why the person did what they did putting that in there. There was a lot of questions asked about that drawing, by the way. I'm, I'm looking at it here. I don't know what to make of it. Okay, I don't. I it, uh, But that... Looks to me to be a, a flying saucer emblem. It was, mm-hmm. and, and it's done with intention. That's the only thing. Oh, absolutely. That's the only thing that I can think of. And as I look at this, it's a very, very impressive uh, drawing. Now it looks like a devil, right? He's got a tail. 
Uh, I don't know yep. if those are arms or wings. It's kind of strange. You're right about the three finger or the three toes, but he's got a suit on, and he looks like he's flying, and uh, uh, he's got an emblem, and that emblem looks like a flying saucer, and this is in a government report about the UFOs that were sighted over Washington D.C. Um, I have no idea that that's uh, that when I saw this earlier today, I, I, I stopped. Now there was also Clifford here, um, earlier. I don't know what page it was on, but there's some newspaper clippings and one is of a party and I didn't make any notes of it. What, why it's, um, it's on page 63 invites you to drive out today or this evening and visit with the Lake Barcroft Estates home sites for okay it's it's a it's a real estate listing but why is this in here uh i'm not sure why they put that in there but a lot of times when they go ahead and do these newspaper clippings they would take out uh the story about the incident in which the file was supposed to be about and sometimes they'd go ahead and take out some of the uh, advertisement also not that they were necessary or they were supposed to be there but that would happen from time to time. And uh, before we get out of this document and move on to another one, what other pages should we look at here? Oh, I don't know. I, the, the whole thing is interesting. But, uh, the, the first 25 pages, at least, you see where they have radar experts. Uh, uh, they're in the tower who observe what they saw. And, of course, they're making it clear they're keeping an open mind, but something was flying in Washington, the the air above Washington, on that night in question. And these people would know. When you get to the next set, you have people trying to downplay it. Okay, I am going to, uh, let me get this posted up here really quick, and this is uh, page 80. I've got to put this up in Twitter for everybody just so that they, they can check this out. I don't oh, know what to make. Please do. I want everyone to see these documents. It's, it's the emblem, man. It's the emblem that just uh, throws me for a loop here. I don't, I don't know what this, uh, I don't know what that is all about. Let's. Um, I think Major Fournette is the one that actually did that drawing and posted it there because he was very angry and upset that people did not want to go ahead and let him speak, and also at the time, even uh, Professor Hynek. But they did not want those two people to speak at that time because both of them was coming around where they felt that there was more to UFOs. Hynek made the statement based on this particular incident and the other things he saw because initially when he got involved as the scientific consultant to the Air Force, he stated these UFOs are, are these flying objects are going to go the way of the sea serpent. After the end of the summer, they're going to be gone. Well, that didn't happen. Then he came out and stated, "There's got to be something to this because we have inc- we have uh, incredible events being reported by very credible people, and even General Sam- uh, Sanford would use that in his press conference. But it was Hynek that initially made the statement." Keeping that in mind, that they knew that Hynek would not go ahead and say, look, there's nothing to these. They're not deserving of being investigated. He was invited to be an observer on the Robinson panel, but not to participate. Major Fournette, he goes in, he tells the Robinson panel, look, these are the cases we have gone over. We have done investigation after investigation and we only have one conclusion after eliminating all the others one by one very meticulously and that is some ufos are interplanetary spacecraft visiting our planet and of course they rejected that the uh the report clear once the best parts about this uh, is is the radar data and the conversations that were going on in between the departments about that data and how specific it was and then uh, 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 it's it's mentioned in a few places in the report so I'm taking it off of uh, page 76 right here but mm-hmm. it's also in the opening that it was sporadic 
The sightings, uh, the radar data was intermittent. It was capable of dropping out of the pattern at will. Uh, a creeping appearance uh, that it just disappeared from the scope, that it was a solid object, and that these were unidentified targets being picked up uh, 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 in the past four months. And I'm quoting here. It says four months, but never before were there so many as were experienced on the nights of the 19th and the 20th and the 26th and the 27th, July 1952. This is uh, clear in the report, and you don't have to interpret what they are writing here. The report is very clear and to the point. Absolutely. Let's uh, let's go to the next document uh, before we hit the break, which is in order. This one is titled uh, Department of Defense Minutes of Press Conference Held by John uh, Major General John A. Sanford. And now the thing is about this, uh, uh, we have all, including myself, I have seen this press conference many times. I watched pieces of it the other day, uh, once again, after speaking with you, also featured in uh, the the documentary uh, UFO, uh, which came out, when did that come out? 1950? That came out in 56, and to this day, I believe that is the best UFO documentary ever made. Yep, yep. This The scene with them, the reenactment of the radar uh, event, when they were looking at the radar patterns on the scope, uh, and uh, was word for word what went down in the radar room that night. Yes, sir. Okay, let's go through this document. Uh, I'm hoping everybody has got it open. Uh, here we go. Now, this is minutes. This is the report from the press conference, uh, which was held July 29th, 1952 at 4 p.m., room 3E869 in the Pentagon. That is correct, and the whole situation is, is that the media is being, because this was creating national news, national concern. There was panic because of what happened there. There was fear because of what happened there, so the Air Force had to do something. So they held this press conference assuring everyone that this was nothing more than temperature inversions, malfunction of the radar equipment, and uh, all of that good stuff, but the situation is the uh, Blue Book file shows that was not the case. But General Sanford had to do that. Later on, we're going to find out while, while he was briefing. At the same time, he was briefing the media about this in a, another room in the Pentagon about four doors down. The uh, director of Central Intelligence was holding a briefing of his own, talking to, among other people, Major Fournay, in which they were making it clear that they had they had no conclusions as to what really caused the sightings that night. Of course, Major Fournay, once again, had already concluded some UFOs were interplanetary. What I love about this document, because we have only seen uh, clips from the press conference, here mm -hmm. you've got all of the questions that were laid out by the press and Samford's responses to them. It is much more detailed than the short little clips that we have got out there um, in YouTube land and, and what we have seen, in, in like I said, in the, in the documentary UFO. This is some of the best reading, and I have no idea how many pages is this guy. This is uh, it's forty pages, forty four pages long, and it is word for word of the uh, back and forth between uh, not only um, now uh, we we need to make note here. Uh, General Roger Ramey is there. Yep. Uh, Donald Brewer is there. Um, uh, Captain Roy James of the Electronics Branch, the Air Tactical Intelligence Center, right? Of course, you've got uh, Ed Ruppelt, and it's uh, it's an amazing document. And to go and read this back and forth with the press, the the country and the press were very, very, very concerned. 
And the dance that these guys do compared to what was written in the report and how concerned they were in the report versus how they dealt with the uh, the public about this, it's two different situations 180 degrees apart. Oh, absolutely. I don't want to get ahead of myself in the documents, but to make it a, uh, a long story short, these people were creating a cover story. Therefore, I don't want to say they were lying, but they knew what they were stating was not the truth and were, were not the facts as they were known. But they were required to go ahead and create this cover story to try to go ahead and stem the, the, the fear and uh, near panic the public had about this one night in July of 1952. But that one night created a firestorm in the intelligence community in Washington, D.C., in which the CIA, who actually controls the UFO programs, period, and the Office of Scientific Intelligence, which is the office that to this day within the CIA controls all the information on UFOs, period. How close were we uh, between the departments and and the president back in 1952 to a full blown disclosure? Who was supporting it? Oh, everyone in the intelligence community, and the FBI, as you'll see in some of the other documents, was even concerned about the uh, CIA covering up most of the information on UFOs. They had a person who was appointed to what we call the Intelligence Advisory Committee. And everyone in the Intelligence Advisory Committee says, look, there's something going on. And, you know, even the Department of Defense was coming in and says, look, we need to be able to expedite our methods so we can quickly and rapidly identify these unknowns to determine whether we have a problem or we don't have a problem. But, you know, it's, it, the, the process right now is too slow. We need to go ahead and be able to rapidly uh, respond to UFO reports and get truthful and honest conclusions as to what they are and what's causing them. The, the director of Central Intelligence Agency did not want this to happen because he did not want the truth to come out. We were so close that it was dead reckoning that he had to convince the uh, IAC, the, the Intelligence Advisory Committee, to forget about getting the National Security Council involved to where they would go ahead and issue a National Security Council intelligence uh, directive. Had that happened, the entire intelligence community would be working on answers and solutions to the UFO problem, which the answers and solutions was already there. But they would now be formulated with not just a little office there at Wright-Patterson uh, giving lip service to UFO reports, but the actual hard data that was being collected and analyzed would now be part of a finalized intelligence product that, I'm sorry, would have been leaked to the media, and the truth would be out. Let's take a break right here, Clifford. we got to do it. We'll take a quick commercial break. This is Fade to Black. When we come back, we're going in order down the document list off of uh, JimmyChurchRadio.com. We're going to check out document number three, a preliminary study of unidentified targets observed on air traffic control radars. It's an amazing read. Our guest tonight, Clifford Stone, on Disclosure. This is Fade to Black. Stay with us. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRARadio.com. ¿Qué tal mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzonel, tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. ¡Claro que sí! Hurricanes, earthquakes. 
earthquakes, wildfires. This year we've experienced more than our fair share. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. And last month I decided to make sure my family does not have to worry about food should we get caught in a real emergency situation. Introducing Numana, a healthy, storable product that tastes so good that you'll want to eat it every day instead of just during those times of duress. All Numana products have a 25-year shelf life, are MSG and GMO-free, no preservatives, and are made in America. With the Numana pack in your home, you'll be able to sleep at night knowing that you've protected your family. Not only have I tasted and tested, I own it. Now you can too. Just click on the Numana banner on JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code Jimmy when you order. In addition to a discount, we'll send you an autographed Fade to Black t-shirt. Seriously, go back Lee Tappy. Do you want to be an official Fade or Not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at JimmyChurchRadio.com. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. <laughs> KGRARadio.com If you have hard water, the lime scale not only leaves white spots, it clogs pipes and breaks down appliances, costing you hundreds of dollars in energy and wear. Eliminate lime scale and other water issues like brown staining and bad odors with HydroCare water products available from Wave Home Solutions. Wave's affordable water systems don't use salts or chemicals. You'll love the way your water tastes, smells, and looks. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? you love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Coast to coast. <laughs> Welcome back, Fate to Black. Uh, yes, I did. I was just reading an email. Fate to Black, I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Clifford Stone. And we are discussing disclosure and what was going down uh, with the huge UFO sighting that happened over in Washington, D.C. back in July of 1952. And uh, Clifford, we are at a document number three. A preliminary study of unidentified targets observed on air traffic control radars by Richard C. Borden Electronics Division and Terry K. Vickers Navigation Aids Evaluation Division, Technical Department, Report Number 180. What did we get in this document? Okay, this is where they did an analysis of the uh, UFOs uh, for the months of uh, July and even going into August, uh, you'll note 1960, uh, there were 68 UFOs 
I think it was on the night of August the 13th, that went over to Washington, D.C. And, of course, they were hitting up on all these being temperature inversions. They had one object that was doing maybe 110 miles, and they decided that possibly was an aircraft. But once again, this report goes against what the experts, not just, you know, some kid that joined the Air Force and became a radar technician, but experts in the UFOs are in the electronics build that were experts on radar. I uh, have to say in the uh, first document dealing with the uh, Project Blue Book file, the UFO sightings on that particular night. But they're trying to downplay it. Once again, they had to downplay it. I don't know for sure, but I'm of the opinion that these people also were directed to be less than truthful in what they were telling the public, because this was not a classified report. It would be available to the media. So, once again, they won what the uh, press conference said. They wanted this to go ahead and uh, support what General Sanford said at the press conference. So, they did a good job on that. So, now you've got two documents out there trying to squelch what's going on. Yet, behind the scenes, no one... No one knew what was going down with uh, the debate and the discussions within the Intelligence Advisory uh, Committee. Yeah, what's, uh, what's great this, here is uh, page nine, page nine in this document, and it goes right back to the scene of uh, the documentary UFO, which came out in 1956. Oh, yes. This is uh, exactly what um, I remember seeing in the recreation of, uh, and also page 12, too, as well, of uh, that famous scene from the movie in 1956. But what is interesting here, uh, Clifford, is that temperature inversions aren't sighted uh, on the ground and in airplanes and causing uh, phone calls to go into the Pentagon asking about the sightings that are happening right now over Washington, D.C. Oh, absolutely not. And, I mean, no one heard of ball lightning until the word was invented right? Uh, to try to cover up UFOs. And even to this day, we, and as a result of events that happened on board a submarine in 1967, where they were hitting up on a battery there, and uh, one of the big, uh, uh, I don't know what they call them, uh, oceanographic batteries on a submarine. They were connected and it arced. So they took pictures of when it arced, these balls of light dancing around, which were electrical sparks essentially uh, being thrown off the battery, but they were spherical shape, and of course they came up. And here's proof that ball lightning exists. At one point, we were researching uh, the possibility of using ball lightning as a weapon. And I bet you very few people know about that. But I have the documentation to back me up on what I'm saying there. Now, we're going to go to the next one, which is uh, the ORR Diary. Um, and it, uh, it's a little out of order, I believe. Uh, it's the oh, oh, yeah. Like I say, there was over, there's over 100 uh, documents I have dealing with just this. this is, I'll tell you right now, I'm being inspired to try to write a new book based on this based on the fact that disclosure almost happened. And this this is a CIA document, uh, the ORR oh, yeah. uh, diary, and this is dated uh, July 31st, 1952, uh, labeled secret but uh, approved for release uh, back in 2000. And take that, What what is the ORR? Uh, I'm not sure what the OR uh, really stands for. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but it's the uh, Office of Some Type of Research. Right. It ties in with the Office of Scientific uh, Intelligence. Now, this document is, is important because it's talking about 
various things that happened uh, actually for that whole week. But if you go to page two, about halfway down the document, you will come to a part there that took, takes place at the same time that uh, General Sanford is giving his press conference. There, the uh, director of Central Intelligence is uh, briefing and being briefed by several other people within the intelligence community. One of those is Major Fournette, and uh, the uh, CIA people, the CIA director included, is telling the people who are being briefed there that they have no conclusions as to what really caused the sightings of the uh, UFO sightings on the night of July 26th and 27th, because within the intelligence community, at a top secret level, there is major concern and major questions being asked by people in high places. So here it is, they're putting this out. This is going to be the start of from July all the way into uh, January of 53, trying to formulate a conclusion on how to go ahead and get the entire intelligence community involved in UFO research, something that the director of Central Intelligence did not want to happen. It says here, um, it's, it's right in the middle of page two, Visited yes, visited with Major Dewey Fournette, uh, Topical Division Directorate of Intelligence, USAF, uh, ONI, and discussed the increase in unidentified flying object reports. There were no conclusions. Uh, and the meeting was for a half hour, and that was on July 29th. Yes, sir. Wow. Same time as the uh, press conference was being held approximately four doors down from where the press conference was. I wonder what would have happened if one of those newsmen accidentally went into the wrong room and heard what was being said in this particular room. Right, 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 right. I can, I can only imagine, uh, Clifford, these conversations that were going on at the Pentagon back then uh, and uh, with the CIA all the way to the White House. And... It, You know, sir, we're in the same situation right now within the intelligence community uh, as they were back then. You have a group of people who know the truth and want that truth to be brought out. You have a group of people which unfortunately have the powers that be in that group that still want to keep it under wraps. But there's a struggle there, and that's a good thing, because ultimately, I hope good wins out and the truth comes out. But this right here, it's a start because people don't believe that there was ever a period of time in which the the truth almost came out. And actually, we're at the shore here again with it uh, possibly coming out. Because there are other people, other than just me, that are trying to get the documentation on the research that was being done on uh, the unconventional aircraft that they were told to watch. And also they were told, you know, even if you, you know, think that the speeds are too fast or that they're making erratic maneuvers, you report that. Don't go ahead and try to make conclusions in your own mind why it's happening. But, you know, the whole situation is they were doing research, and they've been doing it for a long time. Even the CIA had directives on how to do this research on uh, unconventional uh, aircraft. Let's go to uh, uh, two weeks later after the press conference is uh, this next document, which is dated the 14th of August, 1952. Uh, entitled Flying Saucers, again, uh, stamped secret, and then approved for release in 2001. Uh, What do we get in this document? Well, uh, let's see, there's three documents there in the Part 4 section, and these are uh, documents that that shows that there truly was a concern 
about UFOs being a uh, an, an, a intelligence issue that there was concerns about uh, UFOs being uh, concerns for uh, how they could be used even for psychological warfare. People were trying to downplay that. And the whole situation is there was no downplaying it because we saw where we could use it. There was concerns that the Russians might see where they could use it. And a major effort was being made to uh, show the intelligence committee, i.e. the uh, the intelligence advisory committee, actually what was going on. It says here, this is uh, an incredible statement in this document, uh, where they go on, they talk about uh, the uh, July 29th uh, General Samford uh, press conference, in which he stated that the analysis shows no pattern of anything remotely consistent with any menace to the United States. They go on to say, at this point, OSI felt that it would be timely to make an evaluation of the Air Force study, its methodology and coverage, the relation of its conclusions to various theories which have been uh, propounded, and to try to reach some conclusion as to the intelligence implications of the problem. In view of the wide interest within the agency... CIA. This briefing has been arranged so that we could report on the survey. It must be mentioned that outside knowledge of agency interest in flying saucers carries the risk of making the problem even more serious in the public mind than it already is, which we and Air Force agree must be avoided. Yep. That's about they were trying to convince the uh, IAC at that time to stop it. We don't need to go any further. It's being handled, taken care of by appropriate authorities and people, so we don't need to discuss this anymore. Uh, fortunately, there were members of the Intelligence Advisory Committee that felt that there was something going on and it needed to be discussed, and also we needed to get the entire intelligence community involved which at that that time it was not and why bother we already knew the truth this is a, this is an incredible document it says in order to supply both breadth and depth uh, to the survey we have reviewed our own intelligence going back to the swedish sightings of 1946 reviewed a large number of individual official reports recent press and magazine coverage and the main popular books indexes of soviet press were scanned we interviewed a representative of air force special study group following this we spent a day at right field in a thorough discussion with officers conducting the ATIC study, and finally we took the problem to a selected group of our own consultants, all leaders in their scientific fields. From this, we have come up with facts, theories, and explanations, and some conclusions, which we will cover in a brief summary of flying uh, of flying saucers history, an analysis of the ATIC work, and a discussion of the explained sightings and all possible theories regarding the unexplained. We make no recommendations of actions. We would ask that questions be held till the end. Wow. Man. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's the second document. The first document uh, that uh, was there, because there's three documents involved in uh, part four there. The first document uh, is, let me get it. And and while you're doing that, it's it's pretty interesting uh, here that they mention Kenneth Arnold. Uh, oh yes, they mention Kenneth Arnold, a nine disc flying information past Mount Rainier. Uh, then they mention a July 1947 uh, from a doctor in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I'm wondering if that was Rhodes, the pilot and co-pilot of a United Airliner in Boise, Idaho and field staff members at Moroc Test Base in California. These are all sightings, and they go back and mention Sweden. Um, the, they talk about... Sweden's Gen- important. Yes, it is. And uh, the January 1948 interception was attempted at Goldman Field, Kentucky. Uh, that, of, of course... Uh, Captain, Mantell was killed there. Yep, Captain Mantell. 
Uh, they bring up uh, uh, Fargo, no- North Dakota. There's a whole list of uh, of sightings here. You know what's missing? Roswell. Very well, interesting. Yeah, because the, the, that, that was the key. The whole situation is people who knew about the recovery of debris and even dead aliens, people who knew about this stuff was always cautioned. You cannot go ahead and conclude that UFOs have a, an interplanetary origin without, quote, physical proof, physical hardware. Now, the people who knew that that was in these committees, they knew it. But here again, if you are going to be talking about something that's top secret, compartmentalized, and uh, considered to be special access programs, you cannot talk openly about those or even bring them up unless you know everyone in there is cleared for that information. So that never happened. And the first uh, document that you would have there is entitled uh, uh, Intelligence Advisory Committee Unidentified Flying Objects is the title underneath that in parentheses, flying saucers. Now, this is where they went ahead and briefed the secretary, uh, the uh, uh, D- uh, DIC, but, of course, uh, Secretary Lovett would later become head of the National Security Council, and that's why you have that little handwritten in enclosures at the top that says, uh, ultimately, the the NSC, and I don't know how many pages are in here, but uh, around 40, I'd say. But that's got some very interesting information in it. And, of course, this right here was uh, the document that started to get the uh, the, the IAC, the Intelligence Advisory Committee, moving forward, was trying to get the NSC involved, which, once again, I have to stress, the director of Central Intelligence did not want that to happen. He wanted UFOs to be played down. There, there, there's a, a couple of very interesting uh, uh, incidents that are in this document, the August 14th document. And they talk about uh, two, well, they, there's a whole load of them. And one of them uh, was in Sandy Hook. Um, and so they talk about that, but then they continue and then it says the third acute, uh, uh, the third occurred f- a few days ago at Wright Field and has not yet been fully analyzed. Two F ninety fours with gun cameras were vectored in on uh, on a blip. Both pilots sighted the object, and one locked on with his AI equipment. Reaching a maximum allowable altitude, he triggered his gun camera, and the negative shows an object. <laughs> it's just like th- these and are these are amazing. They documents. cannot find that film today in the film library. It was never sent to Blue Book. It was sent to the National Photo Interpretation uh, Laboratories there at Wright Patterson. Later, it was sent on to Washington D.C to the National Reconnaissance Organization. The, there's another report in here. I've never heard uh, about this one. There's a few in here. What, um, that an object was sighted over White Sands on radar traveling at 18,000 miles per hour. And yes, there was. And that was in 52 also. Yes, it was. It was uh, all of the, uh, everything that is in this report was between July and August 14th of uh, Mm -hmm. 1947. Absolutely What I can't prove right now was that uh, the president wanted to be fully briefed. And I got the document somewhere where it surfaced again in 57, where a general had to brief another general because the general he briefed was going to brief the president of the United States, who at that time would have been Eisenhower. 
I'm, I'm, Eisenhower avoided, you know, talking about UFOs, but Eisenhower was very interested. We need to uh, we need to get to a break. Let's go to this next document, which I have open here, uh, which is dated uh, October 11th. Intelligence Advisory Committee. Flying objects, flying saucers, uh, stamped top secret. Set us up for this, and we'll talk about it after the break. Okay, sir. Let me see if I can find that one. This is October 11th, which is, oddly enough, the day after my birthday. And uh, attached is a, is a proposed letter to the Secretary Lovett from the DCI recommending the initiation of fundamental scientific research with respect to the nature and causes of unidentified flying object, flying saucers. Oh, yeah, this this right here was the uh, first orientation of the, in, uh, and, uh, the Intelligence Advisory Committee to try to go ahead and work on a system in which the entire intelligence community would be involved. Uh, and that's the one I said was about 30, 30 pages. Uh, but th- this is a crucial document right here because it started, you know, conversation within the IAC about UFOs and about uh, the need to go ahead and get uh, it to where we can rapidly identify the UFOs to where they're not as threatening to the public per se. But also they were trying to make it clear we don't know what they are. They appear to be under intelligent control, and they're exhibiting technology that we might understand, but we don't know how to replicate. And, of course, this, again, was to make an effort to get that uh, National Security Council Intelligence Directive issued to where the entire intelligence community would be involved, which the CIA did not want to do. A lot of people may not be aware of this, but J. Edgar Hoover, uh, head of the FBI, was very interested in UFOs and clearly believed that the CIA was covering up UFOs. And one of the things that he learned from one of the people who set in on the IAC, one of the FBI agents, he reported back to J. Edgar Hoover that there were many people in the Pentagon that believed some UFOs were, in fact, extraterrestrial vehicles. You'll be getting to those documents here very shortly. Yeah, we'll do but that. this right here, this, this one document, uh, this is a document that initially got things started to where the IAC was saying, okay, we've had enough baloney coming over here. We need to address this issue. And uh, from this day forward, all the way to, uh, actually it goes in, to February, because that's when they started filled it to other people saying, you know, the Robinson panel made this conclusion and thinks we should bunk all this, and we don't feel that we need to bother the NSA now. How do you feel about it? And, of course, they downplayed it, and it died a quick death. Well, we have Um, um, here, you know, the subject, you know, the problem, uh, one, two, facts and discussion, three, Conclusions, flying saucers pose two elements of danger which have national security implications. The first involves mass psychological considerations, and the second concerns are the vulnerability of the United States to air attack. Right yep. right there in this document. Let's take a break right here, Clifford. We'll continue with this and get to all of them uh, in, in these next two segments of the show. This is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight is Clifford Stone. We're discussing how close we were to disclosure. You think it's heavy today. Back in 1952, it was seriously going down. We're discussing all of this, and we'll be right back. Stay with us. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Metal Guard, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station. Salt Lake City, Utah. Van Buren, Arkansas. Poor water quality is a major health issue, and it's only getting worse. Municipalities can't keep up, standards have dropped, and pollutants are increasing. Where does it all end? It ends by keeping the pollutants outside of your home with HydroCare's advanced systems available at Wave Home Solutions. No less than the best purification materials and processes have been developed by HydroCare to provide you with healthy, clean water for drinking, cooking, and showering. 
HydroCare far surpasses the competition in removing chlorine, odors, iron, lead, chemicals, lime skill, and much more. Don't settle for less when it comes to your water. We'll take care of the toughest water problems for you, whether it's from a city or well source. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, call 888-997-WAVE. That's 888-997-WAVE. Or go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. Wave Home Solutions for a healthy, comfortable home. Your contact for current news and trending topics. KGRARadio.com Does your basement or crawl space have a damp, musty smell? Well, watch out! That's a sign of too much moisture and not enough ventilation. And that can mean increased mold growth and the buildup of harmful toxins and gases. Don't bother with a dehumidifier. It just circulates the same unhealthy air. Now there's a better way to remove these dangers and odors. It's with the computerized Wave Moisture Control Unit that reduces moisture and expels pollutants. We replaced our old dehumidifier with the Wave unit, and in only three weeks, our basement is dry and the musty smell is gone. Wave units require no maintenance, no buckets of water or filters, and costs only pennies a day to run. Breathe better, live healthier with an affordable, no-maintenance Wave unit. Call 888-717-WAVE, 888-717-WAVE, or visit dryhealthyhome.com, dryhealthyhome.com. Dry the This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon coffee banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B blend. So are you tired of being tired? Well, then it's time to get the tea. Hey, it's Lisa here to tell you about this all-natural, all-organic tea I've been drinking that has had great results for over 20 years. It's called Life Change Tea, and it's specially formulated to help detoxify and cleanse your kidneys, liver, colon, and blood all at once. The colon is one of the most ignored organs in the human body. The faster that waste is eliminated from the body, the less time that waste sits in our intestines, spreading toxins to our bloodstream. This tea helps cleanse chemicals caused by outside intruders from our entire digestive system. And get this, weight loss can be a side effect. And with continued use of the tea, you can experience clear, healthier, younger looking skin, increased energy, and a happier outlook on life. So if you're tired of being tired, get the life change tea at getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. And like me, you'll be glad you did. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back, Fade to Black, an amazing show tonight with Clifford Stone. These documents are absolutely incredible. You can view all of them over at jimmychurchradio.com. You can go to the Clifford Stone page, and everything is there in order. Now, Clifford, looking at this next document, the October 11th document, we've got a lot more to cover here, so we're going to try to get through as much of this as we can. But on this document, pages 6, 7, 8, and 9 are extraordinary, and there's little clips in each one that that stand out and and one is in paragraph 3 on page 6 
They state, since 1947, ATIC has received approximately 1,500 official reports of sightings, plus an enormous volume of letters, phone calls, and press reports. During July 1952 alone, official reports totaled 250. Of the 1,500 reports, Air Force carries a 20% as unexplained, and of those received from January through July 1952, it carries a 28% unexplained. That's an extraordinary statement in this document. Oh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, it led to some official orders being given concerning that. 1952 was the largest number of sightings of unidentified flying objects reported officially to the U.S. Air Force. And it was 1,500, actually, there was more than that, but, you know, it being officially reported, it still stood out. 20%, the Air Defense Command, and even General Ramey, because General Ramey was the one that gave the order, right. that 20% is too high of a percentage. They needed to get that percentage under 10%. So the whole situation is they were ordered. They didn't care what the actual conclusion was or whatever. But from here on in, it would be under, and this started in 53, by the way, uh, but it would be under uh, 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 20%. As a matter of fact, it would behoove them to make it under 10%. From that year on, essentially every percentage of unknowns was on the average 7.7% unknowns. With that being said, you would have UFOs that would be identified as possible aircraft, possible meteors, possible weather uh, anomalies, and what would happen is go ahead and post that when it died no longer was newsworthy to the national media they would change that possible to aircraft that possible uh, meteor to meteor it didn't have to be true after all blue book was to serve as a public relations organization the best way to show this is that the national reconnaissance organization had already addressed that some people were reporting our high-flying reconnaissance aircraft, like U-2, SR-71, uh, A-70, all these good things, they were reporting these, and they, they would appear unusual to people who wasn't used to seeing them, as uh, UFOs. And, of course, Blue Book knew this, but they had to go ahead and say, well, it was possibly an aircraft, me, or whatever, to just keep it quiet, because the NRO at that time was so, so secret that... Very few people, even within the U.S. government, knew of the existence of that organization. Congress didn't know about it until 1992 for the first time. 1992, the NRA, the existence of it became known. But prior to that, no. So the whole situation is they try to downplay it that way. And the CIA did a document dealing with UFOs trying to explain it the same way. None of that was true, simply because the cases that was really investigated was by Air Force Intelligence, to wit, beginning off with the 4602nd Air Intelligence Service Squadron, and the same beast by a different name all the way through to the closure of Blue Book, and after that it still continued. All the information, critical information, was reported back to the, uh, the CIA's Office of, Office of Scientific Intelligence, to this day, that office has the truth of what we need to know. That office maintains files also on moon dust and blue fly. There was a big debate over that because NASA felt they should be more involved, and the office of special and uh, uh, the office of scientific intelligence told NASA essentially to back off. You do what we tell you. You don't tell us what to do. Also, the uh, the report uh, states here that, and I can read this actually directly. It's a it's a pretty pretty amazing thing for them to say. It says, it says that the United States press 
uh, and the population uh, with the Air Force indicates that a fair proportion of our population is mentally conditioned to the acceptance of the incredible. In this fact lies the potential for the touching off of mass hysteria and panic. So they were obviously trying to deal with, uh, you know, they wanted to, uh, you know, bring this out to the public. They felt that the public could handle it, but they were also afraid of mass hysteria if they were revealed the truth. And they continue on to say, from an operational point of view, three actions are required. A, immediate steps should be taken to improve identification of both visual and electronic phantom so that in the event of an attack, an incident positive identification can be made. B, a study should be instituted to determine what, if any, uh, utilization could be made of these phenomena right by the united states psychological warfare planners and what if any defenses could be planned in anticipation of soviet attempts to utilize them c in order to minimize risk of panic a national policy should be established as to what should be told to the public regarding the phenomenon and actually about the psychological warfare situation, yes. that was addressed in January of 1952 by the psychological uh, intelligence group there. And you actually have the document there. Yes, I have it. And they were also, uh, and we'll, we'll get to that next, um, they were desperately scrambling to find out what the Soviets knew about UFOs and ETs. They, they, you know, the Soviet Union was so closed down back then, it was difficult for us to get that information. And they make that point here. And uh, also how the Soviets uh, could uh, take advantage of the technology, I'm quoting here, to utilize the phenomena to the detriment of the United States security interest. But everyone knows UFOs don't exist, so how can there be a technology? That's right. <laughs> and it's right here clearly stated in the document. Let's go. You see why I feel these documents are so important for everyone to see? Yes. It's it, it's incredible reading. Incredible. Let's uh let's get to as much of these as we can before the next break. Uh the next one is a CIA uh document and uh this is uh dated uh Document 19, 1st of January, 19, January 1, 1952, Flying yes. Saucers. Yes, that right there is by the uh, uh, the psychological uh, board within the CIA, and what they were trying to do was show that... Uh, there was concerns on how the UFO phenomenon could be exploited. And the, the first page, paragraph one, I think says it best, that it was co- concluded that problems connected with unidentified flying objects appear to have implications for psychological warfare as well as for intelligence and operations. And that's what all this report right here was to do bring into play. It it played a critical part after the uh, uh, August uh, 26th, 27th night UFO sightings over Washington, D.C., because the uh, government was trying to build that up, or should I say the CIA was trying to build that up, while keeping the critical factors that some UFOs may be someone else's spacecraft visiting us from somewhere else from out in the cosmos. So that it played a major role in trying to downplay uh, the entire intelligence community getting involved. But like I say, IAC was really pushing to get the entire intelligence community involved. And had that happened, had the National Security uh, Agent or the National Security Council issued the intelligence directive dealing with UFOs. In uh, 1953, February of 1952, or 53 is when it would happen, then by mid-53, the truth would have been out about UFOs being of extraterrestrial origin. He, um, check this out. 
I suggest that we discuss in early board meeting the possible offensive or defensive utilization of these phenomena for psychological warfare purposes, signed Walter B. Smith, director of the CIA. Absolutely. (laughs) Oh, man. Oh, that is nuts. What a crazy document. Okay, Let's, uh, let's get the next one in here before the break, which is... Uh, December, this is document 14, December 11th, 1952, uh, again, st- stamped a top secret interest in flying saucers Thursday, 11th, December, 1952. Okay. Uh, that's document 14. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's showing where J. Edgar Hoover was very concerned about uh, the CIA not being fully truthful with uh, in the uh, Intelligence Advisory Committee's meetings dealing with UFOs. So he wanted more information from the CIA. The director of the CIA took offense to the suggestion that Hoover made and pungently referred to, uh, if he really wants to know the truth, why doesn't he himself attend the uh, IAC meetings? Wow, this is, uh, this is nuts. All the way up to Christmas Eve, by the way. Uh, Christmas Eve checked with blank on the status of the briefing uh, on flying saucers, has been in touch with blank, and no further follow-up is necessary from here. Yeah, he was pretty upset. Mm-hmm. It was that Mr. Hoover is very interested in the subject of flying saucers. It has been reported to him that the matter was discussed at the IAC meeting of the 4th of December. Mr. Hoover had asked to obtain, uh, obtain as much information as we are willing to give him. <laughs> I decided yeah, that well, the, now the second document says it all. Oh, that is incredible. And the next one is... Uh, December 14th, am I reading this right? Uh, no, December 20th, document 21. Am I doing this in order? Please tell me I am. Uh, it's close enough, but it should be October 27th, 1952, yes, a CIA I got it. memo. I got or, it. Right. Uh, FBI memorandum. I've got it. Office Memorandum, United States Government. Here we go. Subject, Flying Saucers, October 27th, 1952. Go ahead. Okay, this one right here shows that the agent that attended the uh, that attended the uh, in, intelligence advisory uh, committee's meetings was informed in the synopsis. Air intelligence advised of another incredible and unexplainable sighting of flying saucers. Air intelligence still feels flying saucers are optical illusions. Are atmospheric phenomena. Yeah, our atmospheric phenomena. But some military officials are seriously considering, seriously considering the possibility of interplanetary spacecraft. <laughs> and of course, that was the key factor with the AIC doing what they were doing. So, uh, with him being told that, he felt that. Somebody within the uh, IAC had the answers, and it goes all the way back to the director of central intelligence, because this is the one that's trying to downplay the UFOs as having anything of any real significance of, you know, being a matter of national defense. Sure, they might go ahead and interfere with an enemy attack on the U.S. So, yeah, we might want to be a little concerned about that. Check this well, out. Actually, we're more concerned because we went ahead and got an agreement with the former Soviet states and the U.S. that if a large number of UFOs were being picked up coming in over the Arctic Circle before we launched an attack on this uh, former Soviet states, we would contact them to see if they were responsible for those objects. Because many objects, on many in- instances, there were alerts that uh, put our uh, bombers and our fighters on alert and become airborne, heading towards their targets, 
because of these large number of UFOs being picked up coming from over the Arctic Circle, which would be the exact path that uh, incoming ICBMs and enemy bombers would be following to attack the U.S. In this document, I remember now when I went through these, uh, this statement here in the second paragraph on, on, on page two, or page one, is this statement. The Air Technical Intelligence Center have advised that after careful study, there were as many as 12 to 16 flying objects recorded on this film, that the possibility of weather balloons, clouds, or other explainable objects has been completely ruled out. Absolutely. It's right there. The Air Technical Intelligence Center experts pointed out that they do not that they could not be optical illusions, as optical illusions could not be recorded on film. End of statement. Right there in this document. This is one of the most impressive documents I've ever seen right here. That is incredible. All of these are incredible, but that's uh, that's uh, just uh, almost too much to absorb. Now we've got another document uh, which uh, is also, oh, wait a minute. No, I am sorry. I apologize. I opened up the same one. Uh, document, uh, this is document 28th, January 18th, 1953. Secret Security Information is the title. Report of meetings of scientific advisory panel on unidentified Flying objects convened by the Office of Scientific Intelligence, CIA, January 14th through the 18th, 1953, F.C. Durant. This right here is what they call the Robinson Panel Report, and it's a synopsis on what happened from day to day. You have Major Fournette going there telling them, hey, look, this, these cases here are some of the best cases we have. We went over them very carefully, and we eliminated the possibilities of them being weather balloons, temperature inversions, and all of that, and leaving us with only one possible conclusion. These cases represent objects of unknown origin originating from another uh, solar system or out in space that the only conclusion we can reach is that these are extraterrestrial spaceships. Well, of course, you know, before the Robinson panel met, the director of the CIA met with them and gave them their instructions on how they were to deal with this. Once again, they informed them to not conclude they are interplanetary without first having hard physical evidence. So therefore, they rejected Major Fournette being out of hand. Now, the National Reconnaissance Organization, only they came in as uh, like they were with the Office of Naval uh, Photo Interpretation and the National Photo uh, uh, Interpretation Office, stating that they had done hundreds of hours on the uh, uh, two films that they had there uh, and stated that the only conclusion they could have was that these were solid or that these were solid objects, and they were possibly interplanetary spacecraft. They rejected that. The panel, while sitting around nursing coffee, going out playing on the golf course, concluded, "Oh well, you know, these are probably just weather balloons, or they're uh, uh, geese, particularly in the one film uh, that was out west, that they were just geese." And uh, they, you know, the experts were totally wrong. But these were supposed to be the scientific experts. Now, I want to point out one thing about the scientific experts on the Robinson panel. More than two-thirds of them worked in trying to identify the ghost rockets in 47, which the U.S. government wanted to keep very quiet about. And the whole situation Given their best efforts, they could not find any crash debris of those objects in 46, going over Sweden and Denmark. Mm -hmm. Yet, in the Robinson panel report, they make it clear, well, if these things were real, then we would find crash debris and all that, which we already had done. But the Robinson panel was a secret uh, report, secret group. 
therefore they could not have exposure to anything above secret. So they they were stuck. That's all they could talk about. Well, here it was with the ghost rockets. They negated the fact that uh, more than two thirds of them worked on the investigation of those, but they didn't find you know any debris neither. But they go back to the Second World War. People reporting these objects, these rockets. And, of course, you know, they looked into it, and it was confirmed very shortly thereafter, getting some reports about them, that they did exist because they found debris. Well, no one brought up about the ghost rockets there in Sweden and Denmark. Then you take in the other consideration. Once again, two-thirds or more worked on what was called Project Twinkle, the green fireball phenomenon here in uh, uh, New Mexico, Texas, uh, Arizona, but primarily New Mexico. Well, here again, these people that worked on it, the scientists who were there with the, the Robinson panel, the two-thirds or so that worked with this project, felt that the green fireball phenomenon was a very serious concern and a potential threat to the national security of the United States. But that's not brought out in the Robinson panel. What happens is the Robinson panel concludes there's nothing to UFOs and that the best we could do and what we should do is go ahead and discourage people from reporting UFOs, period. Thus began Operation Ridicule, which essentially if people reported UFOs, they should be ridiculed and made to look silly so others wouldn't report it. This led to, uh, in uh, Status Report 2, I think it is, Project Blue Book Status Report 2, to one of the, well, with a group of pilots being briefed about UFOs, one of the pilots went ahead and stated that he could be flying wingtip to wingtip with a spaceship and would not report it. This created major concern to the Air Defense Command because they may be flying wingtip to wingtip with an enemy aircraft that was coming here to invade the United States, and because it had an unusual configuration, they did not want to be called foolish because they reported a UFO. The, and a this Robinson panel was important because this is what stopped the National Security Council from even being briefed officially on UFOs. That's right. And one of the things that they clearly tried to do here in the Robertson report was that now we can uh, always use the instability of the witnesses. We can use uh, the the brevity of the sightings, uh, that uh, the instability of the witnesses. Uh, they they used, uh, you know, uh, a half a dozen or a dozen specific cases like Bellefontaine, Ohio, and Utah in, in July 2nd, 1952, Great uh, Falls, Montana. Of course, Washington, D.C., uh, uh, Haneda Air Force Base in Japan, uh, Port Huron in Michigan. Um, these different cases where each one of these cases, and they specifically said this, that each one of these cases could uh, uh, have reasonable explanations that could be used uh, uh, back to the press. And therefore, we can uh, always explain away each one of these sightings, and we don't have to uh, uh, present our official um, uh, uh, determinations to these. And that it would be better that we didn't present our conclusive explanations every time and that's 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 a uh, for the robertson report to actually say that this is how we should handle this moving forward instead of presenting the public with uh the actual facts rupelt was there showing film rupelt was there trying to uh, uh and, and that the panel didn't want to take that tack they wanted to go the opposite with this and throw softballs to the public. And that's that's what I get out of the Robinson report. Oh, no, yeah. Well, now this report, actually, the, the report you have right now was uh, released in December 2017. Prior to that, 
they released similar. They released a report uh, that was similar to this one. I don't know if this one right here had been released prior to that, but all the information is the same. It was in it, but it was very difficult to read. And the CIA said, "This is the best copy we have." So you know, when this one came out, it wasn't part of. They have two files on UFOs, the CIA does. Well, let's say, uh, uh, Clifford, let me jump in right there. i got to take a break. Mm-hmm. i got to take a hard break right here uh, with the network. So let's get this last break in, and then we'll come back and uh, go through the rest of the stuff that we have and come to some conclusions with you. So stay right there. Our guest tonight is Clifford Stone. We've got a lot of stuff to go through tonight, and we're going to get it all in. This is Fade to Black. All of the documents are over at jimmychurchradio.com. Our guest tonight, Clifford Stone, we're discussing disclosure at what went down back in 1952. Stay with us. Hey, what up, y'all? It's your girl Vivica Fox here, and you are listening to my boy, Jimmy Church on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires. This year we've experienced more than our fair share. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and last month I decided to make sure my family does not have to worry about food should we get caught in a real emergency situation. Introducing Numana, a healthy, storable product that tastes so good that you'll want to eat it every day instead of just during those times of duress. All Numana products have a 25-year shelf life, are MSG and GMO-free, no preservatives, and are made in America. With the Numana pack in your home, you'll be able to sleep at night knowing that you've protected your family. Not only have I tasted and tested, I own it. Now you can too. Just click on the Numana banner on JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code Jimmy when you order. In addition to a discount, we'll send you an autographed Fade to Black t-shirt. Seriously, go back Lee Tappy. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I take Life Change Tea supplements every single day. It's what I do. Click on their banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go back, Lee Tepe. Hi, folks. CBD is the home run hitter for health right now. Why, you ask? Because of what it does for the body. Unfortunately, I can't tell you all about the benefit. You know, there's reasons. Do your due diligence and log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com. Ancient Life Oil uses organic ingredients and is blended in coconut oil for some of the best benefits. Legal in 50 states and non-psychoactive. Log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and my family is safe because of Numana Emergency Food Storage. Just go to the Numana banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Promo code Jimmy10. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk Entertainment including the network you're listening to right now, the Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. 
Jimmychurchradio.com. Welcome back, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. You can follow me on Twitter. Everything is happening there right now at J Church Radio. Hashtag F2B. Our guest tonight is Clifford Stone going through a mountain of documents about uh, the potential disclosure that almost happened uh, back in 1952. And before we get back uh, to Clifford, uh, I've got uh, some sad news to report here. Dickie Betts, uh, one of the founding members of the Allman Brothers, uh, fell uh, and uh, hit his head. He's undergoing brain surgery uh, right now, this happened at his home. He was playing with his dog in uh, Sarasota, Florida, at his home. And our thoughts are with uh, Dickie Betts, one of the great. You know, I don't, uh, Clifford. I don't know if you were a, or, or are an Allman Brothers fan, but but for me, the band was just so good, right? I mean, just just stratospheric in its talent and its songwriting. But I I I laser focused on Dickie Betts. I thought Dickie Betts was or is uh, one of the most amazing guitar players ever. It's just really sad, you know, to be playing with your dog and you fall and you hit your head, and the next thing you know, uh, you're getting a, a brain surgery to uh, relieve swelling. So our thoughts are with uh, Dickie Betts. Uh, now uh, going, uh, let's get to this. Uh, it, it may is this our last document? Uh, the one dated. Uh, this is also stamped July twenty ninth, nineteen fifty two. Deputy Director of Intelligence. Uh, subject: Recent sightings of unexplained objects. Yes, sir. And this is a five page document. Please note July twenty ninth, nineteen fifty two. Same time as press conference. Same time as the uh, DIC telling certain members in the intelligence community they had no idea what was going on. This was the start of the major inquiries in, uh, done by the Intelligence Advisory Committee, where they were pushing heavily for a National uh, Security Council Intelligence Directive to be issued. It's five pay, and this is the way it uh, comes from the, uh, the CIA also. So they considered all these documents to represent one document within itself. Well, if you go to the uh, second page. Well, before we do that, uh, before we do that, Clifford, uh, the, uh, the, the intro paragraph here is extremely telling. And I'm, I'm going to read this, and then we're going to go to page two. It says, in the past several weeks, a number of radar and visual sightings of unidentified aerial objects have been reported. Although this office has maintained a continuing review of such reported sightings during the past three years, a special study group has been formed to review this subject. That is an extraordinary statement right there. And, of course, we can make many references back to uh, Majestic or MJ-12, but they specifically state that a study group has been formed to review the subject. Okay, let's go to page two. On on that same subject, on the first page, please note this. uh, uh, The study was with the O slash SI, that's Office of Scientific Intelligence. Now, on page two, if you go down to paragraph four, you find that uh, the very last sentence there states, sightings of unexplained objects at great altitudes and traveling at high speeds in the vicinity of major U.S. defense installations are of such nature that they are not attributable to natural phenomena or known types of aerial vehicles. And, of course, this right here was a letter being typed up December 2nd, 
1952, and it has one attachment. That one attachment is a draft of the actual uh, intelligence directive, uh, the National Security Council intelligence directive that they wanted them to go ahead and make official by it being presented to the uh, NSC and get the entire intelligence community involved. Of course, they state, well, now let's wait until this science, this board of scientists, the Robinson panel, till they go over some of these reports and make their conclusions. I suggest at this time, when the, the director of the national, the when the director of the Central Intelligence Agency briefed them, he very carefully chose his words, making it clear, downplay the UFOs as being any tangible type objects under intelligent control, let alone they might be of extraterrestrial origin. And being good little boys, they did just that. And the intent of the, the panel wasn't to provide any conclusions on UFOs whatsoever. It was to be a uh, jump board, so to speak, to be the final factor in blocking the National Security Agency or the National Security Council from being briefed officially, and I have to say officially, and blocking that National Security Council uh, intelligence directive from ever being issued. Because this way, if it was issued, the entire intelligence community would be involved in the investigation of UFOs. They would have their own protocols on how to do things. They would go ahead and compare notes. And by mid-1953, hard, supportable conclusions would be coming out. Among those conclusions is one, UFOs are tangible objects. They are under intelligent control and they exhibit a uh, technology above and beyond our present day capabilities to replicate. We may understand some of those principles and theory, but we cannot go ahead and make practical application as of this date. Two, in all probability, these objects originate from some other planet, maybe within our solar system or some other planet within the universe in some nearby solar system outside of our own and that a major investigation should be set up to determine what the nature of these objects are and what their purpose in being here is, i.e., are they a threat, are they friendly, and something that we could learn from. The uh, the concern that Walter Smith had, the director of the CIA, back then uh was it was direct he did not he did not play around with his words uh oh, no. you know he wasn't dancing he very specifically instructed that the cia um had to uh, uh get this intelligence uh reporting done uh, uh, the the reports had to be solid. He wanted solid identification of everything that was playing out in the skies, and that this was of uh, 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 the greatest concern of the CIA. And his his directives here are are very to the point. I mean, they're they're direct, Clifford, very direct. But it's still a facade. He has to play like, yo, I'm only taking this concern or, or this serious. And actually, he is taking it serious. But he has, and I don't know what the full reasons are, but he has a direct reckoning to keep the investigations alive and active within the CIA, with them being the controllers of the information and making the final call while directing the other members of the intelligence community to go ahead and make benign conclusions that they know are totally ridiculous and foolish. Right. So, yes, he, he is very direct. He's saying, oh, my God, we really we need to get a handle on this, and we need... But then they get all the way up, and this is all because of the, uh, the 
efforts being made by the Intelligence Advisory Committee. And he can't go in and say, I'm ordering you to drop this subject. He can't do that. So he has to take it serious because, remember, all the way to the President of the United States, they are taking it serious. The President wants answers. So, okay, we're doing this, but it's all the way to the end of 1952. He's already done the draft of the National Security Council Intelligence Directive. It's ready to be issued. Oh, my God, how do we stop this? So it's suggested to the AIC, or the, I, uh, the IAC, the Intelligence Advisory Committee, look, before we take this to the National Security Council and request that they issue that directive, what we should do is have the sci- a scientific panel to meet. And based on their findings, we consider whether we're going to bother the National Security Council with this or not. And that right there, they blocked it. They were the ones that went ahead and ignored all the experts in the field. And if you go over that document, please note that on some of the cases, they didn't meet as a a group of people going over everything. It was only three days. And the stuff they were going over, the people who were coming in to brief them, these people were pro Major Fournette, he was pro on interplanetary spacecraft. Uh, you'll read in there where Hynek is there, but only as an observer. Mm-hmm. He can't ask questions. He can't make statements. And until this document surfaced, actually in December of 2000, uh, the, the document before this surfaced in December 2017, no one knew for a fact that, that was going around in the UFO fields, that High Neck was there. And yes, he was there. And this, that document before this one makes that clear he was there, but only as an observer. Because if he'd been permitted to talk, he would have made comments and suggestions that would have been detrimental to what the director of the Central Intelligence Agency was trying to accomplish. And that was, no matter what it took, They had to kill the uh, efforts to try to get the National Security Council to issue officially the intelligence directive. Now, with that being said, was the National Security Council advised? Members of the National Security Council was fully aware that some UFOs were of interplanetary origin. They were also fully aware of the meetings that we had with our visitors. And those meetings were necessary to ensure that we children did not destroy ourselves by misidentifying UFOs as incoming ICBMs or bombers from the former Soviet states. Our visitors knew this, which is why they went ahead and opened up the conversations. And they were the ones that determined where we would meet and uh, why we would meet. How close, you know, when we consider what we went through since December of uh, 2017 through today with the way that the press was uh, finally covering this. But like you said, and I've said this many times, uh, Clifford, uh, they took their foot off the gas. You know, but, but it was covered. You know, I I was very happy about that. But it, it just seems that the the momentum has stalled. How close were we to something just as extraordinary going down uh, back in 1952? Were, were we minutes away? We we were, I'm going to say just several hours away. Because it was, you know, at the final hour that this was already, I mean, they went so far to make the draft. And, of course, the cover letter on there making it clear, which is contrary to what the uh, Robinson panel came out with, that the sheer nature of some of these sightings, the altitude that they were at, the maneuvers they were doing, that they they could not be explained away by 
natural phenomena or weather phenomena. They could not be explained away by any known vehicle. In short, these were vehicles that were doing extraordinary things that we were not capable of doing, nor was any other nation on the face of this planet capable of doing. That's why they wanted to have that National Security Council Intelligence Directive issued. Now, move on to to, uh, December 2017. Once again, the same thing. We want to go ahead and we want to investigate these objects that are flying around, only we're calling them uh, unconventional advanced aircraft. And we're gathering all the data. We're telling the people that see these things, you know, disregard everything you believe and know. Report exactly what you are seeing. Get as much as technical data as possible. If you can take film footage of them, take it. If you can take telemetry, uh, uh, telemetry readings of them, take it. If you can get radar uh, sightings along with the telemetry readings, do it. But then when the story breaks in the news, we downplay it. And we thought we stopped that in 2012. No, we didn't. Moon dust and blue fly, the names became exposed in 1985. By the virtue of the, those code names being exposed, they changed the names, but the programs still go on. Why? UFOs haven't gone away. Mm-hmm. Right now, people see UFOs, but they don't bother to report them. They, you know, mentally tell themselves, okay, this, this is probably some type of new craft or a spacecraft of the U.S. or some other government. Unless it is an event of high strangeness, it goes unreported. And then when it is reported, it's normally only local. But you better believe when the news comes out with something and we know that something may have happened there, then we send out the four four brushman say. We send people into that area to gather open intelligence, as we call it, on the sighting that occurred there. And the people think, well, gee, the government didn't investigate this. Yes, they did. You had strangers that came into your town that were selling uh, uh, toilet articles or frozen food, whatever. Hmm. But they were, oh, by the way, we heard you had a UFO sighting here the other day. What about that? And that's not falling on dead ears. We still investigate UFOs. And we have UFOs in space. The whole situation is the term fast walkers, we may have changed it now, but that was an affectionate term that we used for solid, tangible objects that was flying between a spacecraft, a reconnaissance spacecraft normally, above the Earth and uh, taking photographs down on the Earth. The object would fly in there. And I can't remember what year it was, but they got a hundred and almost two hundred sightings. Eighty seven of the events that were recorded there of the fast walkers remained unexplained. Today we have fighters that go and try to intercept uh, uh unidentified aircraft or uncorrelated targets. These fighters go ahead, sometimes they take gun camera footage of them. That's never reported. None of that's ever that's, that's, uh, reduced to a form called Form 61. It's filed, it's classified uh, secret. Copies are made to send, be sent to other agencies. That form is held there at the, uh, used to be the Air Defense Command, or NORAD. Uh, that was filed for six months. At the end of six months, it was systematically destroyed. Now, did the report go away because after the end of six months, that that form was destroyed? No. The data was already sent to the agencies that had active interest in these sightings, and they did their part, and they sent their their raw material to the Office of Scientific Intelligence at the CIA, and they made a finalized uh, intelligence product, and that went to a few choice people very high in the government that aren't necessarily elected officials. The, uh, well, first off, 
uh, or last off, I want to thank you for taking the time tonight. We did two and a half hours of document coverage. That's a lot of conversation, Clifford. So uh, I want to thank you in advance for that. Um, before we start to run out of time here, I've only got two minutes. I want to say this. I'm going to do this as quick as possible. It, you're exactly right. We had a mass sighting four years ago uh, out in Joshua Tree, a couple of hundred witnesses, more than that behind me. But let's just say there was a couple of hundred people standing around me, uh, video documentation uh, and, and so forth, multiple witnesses. I turned around and went on coast to coast, prime time, Friday night, and spent a half an hour discussing the entire, I might have done two segments, the entire sighting, when and where, how it was done on national radio. I thought that I would have been contacted by the media. Nobody. And I had told Rita as we were walking away that night from that sighting, I said, you know, if we had Wolf Blitzer up here, right, Anderson Cooper, Bill O'Reilly, when he was still employed, would would they... After seeing this, would they go on and and report this? And we both said no, they wouldn't. And uh, and so I, that's when I decided to go on coast to coast and absolutely report this out there for support of all those other hundreds of witnesses that saw this. Right? You know, and and to to back up everything, not one member of the media contacted me. And that 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 just goes to show you where where it's really at, and and you're absolutely right. I couldn't agree with you more. And that's what I went through, Clifford. Oh, I, I know. And I'll tell you. And don't get mad at me for saying this, uh, sir. But we in the UFO field could be our own worst enemies because a lot of times for sensationalism. They'll go ahead and they will report things that they know absolutely isn't true. Yet when the truth starts to come out and what you're talking about, I remember that incident. Mm -hmm. It was 100% true, and I uh, personally believe that you reported very good on it, and what you were stating was 100% accurate. And, you know, the whole situation is, had it not been for the giggle factor and the uh, media being afraid of people laughing at them or not taking them serious right that could have been a big breaking point for ufo disclosure also yes yeah i thought it was i thought there's this is too extraordinary you know and we've got multiple cameras and and hundreds of witnesses and you know it's all right here here we go nothing you could hear a pin drop from the media clifford keep doing what you're doing my man uh this uh, is going to get out, and we're going to put everything out again tomorrow. Of course, this is live radio right now, but I'm going to get all of these documents out through social media tomorrow, and uh, we're going to we're going to make sure that this gets uh, not only seen but heard. Thank you so you much for everything me. that you. Anyone do. Anyone comes to my door wanting copies of these documents, I will gladly give them to them. Somebody and also, somebody you're going to be receiving some pictures from me, oh, and you'll understand you. when you get them, and. You know, you know who's sending them to you. Feel free to go ahead and publish those. And I had a colonel in the United States Air Force tell me those are authentic. Thank you so much, Clifford. I look forward to it. Okay? And uh, I'll be in touch with you tomorrow. But until then, be safe. And whoever is uh, poking around your house, maybe they wanted some documents. You never know. Okay? <laughs> Knock on the front door. They can have them. <laughs> I'll talk to you, Clifford. Have a great, safe rest of your evening, my friend. Thank you, sir. Same to you and to your uh, listeners and your staff there, good night and God bless. Right back at you, Clifford Stone, the absolute very best. And uh, we'll have everything up tomorrow, and I'll put together some stuff uh, with all of these documents for all of you that uh, it'll make it easy for you to chase down. Fade to Black's executive producers, Rita Camarion. Show is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster, Drew the Geek, Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, SpaceboyMusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and syndication is KGRA, The Planet. It's broadcast only copyrighted 2018 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black of the Game Changer Network. 
Thank you, Clifford Stone. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. Until tomorrow night, Fader Night, open lines. Everybody be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.